Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you a little bit about uh, the Oxford Programme for the Future of Cities. I'm not going to be talking about a specific technology tonight, but I'm going to be talking about the context in which technological change over the next 50 years is undoubtedly going to be uh, extremely important. And despite rejoicing in that wonderful title of being Professor of Science and Civilization, I'm some severely e-challenged, e and this may end up going backwards rather than forwards. No, I'm in luck tonight. Um, one of the foci of the uh, program for the future of cities at Oxford uh, is mundane technologies and infrastructure change. And it's only that particular one that I'm going to talk about uh, this evening. And I will get round to talking about toilets in a minute, uh, taking up Professor Sir Hale's uh, theme. But before I talk about toilets, I want to talk about typewriters. Um, and I'm sure that most of you will recognize that sequence of letters on the top of this slide, right? It is, of course, the top line of the standard English typewriter keyboard. Does anybody know why that's the top line of the standard typewriter keyboard? Yes, madam. To make your typewriter feel as comfortable because the keys couldn't be accurate. It was in the days when typewriters were first invented, the keys would jam. And it was, in fact, designed to slow typists down. Some people think it was designed to actually speed yeah. people up, but it was actually the opposite. It was to slow typists down because the keys were jamming. Now, when I f became a junior uh, researcher at the Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee in the mid-1980s, I had one of these things on my desk when I first went in, an IBM golf ball typewriter, no keys already, still had the QWERTY UI up keyboard. A couple of years later, we got up to date and I had one of these things, one of Mr. Gates's Apple II uh, computers installed in my office, uh, and not even any printing device there. So why on earth are we still using the sequence on our keyboard? And the answer is, of course, that when we talk about technologies, we're not just talking about gadgets and gizmos, devices, we're talking about the way pieces of equipment are embedded in social systems uh, and in systems of use. And of course, it's things like type, touch typewriting courses and secretarial schools uh, and things of that sort that have embedded this technology, even though the reason why we had it in the first place has gone away a very long time ago. Um, and I now want to move from typewriters to the city. Because of course, this phenomenon, what we call socio-technical lock-in, uh, is very familiar to us in terms of our urban morphology. The road plans, the street plans of many of Europe's major cities were laid down in Roman times. Some of you will recognize straight away, this is of course uh, the schematic representation of the city of London. You can see the uh, outline of the old Roman wall, the old, old Roman street grid plan there, uh, which has persisted now at least one and a half thousand years uh, since the Romans left. Uh, Britain uh, in the layout of the city of London today. But I want to emphasize that this lock-in isn't just physical, it's also ideational. This is a, uh, an artist's representation of the archaeological remains of Ur of the Chaldees, which was the city uh, from which Abraham uh, got up and left to invent monotheism. Uh, and you can see here, of course, the classic, already the classic morphology of the city, the ceremonial center of political and economic power and religious power, uh, spiritual power in, in the middle here with the ziggurat and the pyramid, the royal palaces around it, and then you see the commercial and residential areas uh, around that and the port off into the distance. Uh, you can fast forward about 4,000 years, uh, and this is, of course, Abu Dhabi today. And my, one is tempted to suggest that although the god has changed uh, in 4,000 years from uh, uh, whoever they worshipped in Ur before Abraham, uh, to Mammon, uh, the, this sort of central morphological concept of, of the city with the big uh, monumental works in the middle still remains very much uh, something that we think of when we construct cities. So the question is, how do we think about this question of lock-in? Is it all bad? Um, no, of course, because actually it's also, in a sense, the lock-in to particular ways of doing things that gives cities their particular character and make them places that people want to live, and they want to live in London rather than some other place, precisely because of lots of the, th of the things that have persisted uh, and become embodied in the material structure and the fabric uh, of the city. But on the other hand, we also recognize the need for change. Change in our energy system, change in the way we process human waste, our use of fresh water, and so on. And I just want to emphasize that what I said earlier, that technologies are social systems mediated by materials and devices. We shouldn't think of them just as bits of kit. 
Uh, this is a frequent mistake. And there is often a dichotomy drawn, which I think is quite false, between bringing about behavioral change in order to promote sustainable development and bringing about technological change. You don't change kit without changing behavior. Um, if you start to uh, uh, want to introduce a different set of technologies, uh, you need to train people to actually be able to install those technologies, as you mentioned, uh, with respect to the very high costs of the, the grey water system that you were looking at uh, in your own home. You need to train people to be able to install those, maintain them, so on and so forth, know how to use them. Similarly, uh, if you want to change uh, behaviour, you need to get, when you want to get, for example, more people using public transport, uh, then you have to actually change the kinds of public transport and the way it operates that you're making available to them. So they are really uh, inseparable these ideas of behavior and, and equipment. And the other thing that uh, I uh, want to emphasize is to suggest that thinking about the city as itself as a technology in this sense, and not just as a single technology, but a nest of technologies. And I'm gonna dig down now into that nest uh, and talk about a few of them and the way that they've shaped the city and some th thoughts about uh, what the prospects are for change. And of course, this was a very early shaper of, of the city as we experience it, it's the sailing ship. Uh, for millennia, this was the only serious way of moving large, heavy cargoes around the planet. Uh, and as a result of that, 23 of the 30 largest cities in the world are built on the coast. And much of the infrastructure of those cities that are built on the coast is either at sea level or it's actually being built on reclaimed land, uh, which is at or below sea level. And that, of course, makes them uh, particularly vulnerable to problems of climatic variability. Uh, this is seeming rather dated given today's news. Um, this is actually a scene of the Crescent City, New Orleans, after Hurricane Katrina. Now, uh, I'm sure that Hurricane Sandy will uh, reignite a lot of the debate about whether or not we've had an increase in hurricane intensity and frequency as a result of climate change. Uh, as I understand the science, uh, actually there's been a very slight increase uh, in hurricane activity over the last 50 years, but if you go back over 100 years, uh, that trend disappears. And we shouldn't forget that the worst hurricane the US has experienced, at least to date, um, historically was the Galveston hurricane at the, in the early 20th century. Um, but what actually led to this scenario wasn't increased intensity of storm activity, it was a failure of the technologies which have been put in place to actually protect New Orleans uh, from, uh, uh, from flooding. It was a failure of the levees uh, system that was in place to do that. Um, and although I said that um, the cost of, uh, sorry, that, that the intensity of hurricanes probably hasn't increased much over the last 100 years, the costs of hurricane damage over the last 50 years from wind and water damage have soared exponentially. They've really gone through the roof. And the reason is um, actually asset location. Anybody know where this is? It's Miami Beach today, okay? That's Miami Beach today. That's Miami Beach in 1920, okay? <laughs> Miami Beach today, Miami Beach 1920. What's causing the costs of wind and water damage to go up? It's clearly putting ex expensive infrastructure, fragile infrastructure in silly places uh, like uh, low-lying barrier islands. And there's an awful lot that can be done with just simple, straightforward things like the adjustment of building codes uh, and the enforcement of building codes. Uh, for those of you who remember Hurricane Andrew a few years ago in the US, there was one builder in Homestead, Florida that didn't lose a single roof in Hurricane Andrew. And I'll wager you all know the name of that builder. Anybody want to hazard a guess? It was Habitat for Humanity, the self-build charity that Jimmy Carter heads up uh, for helping uh, poor people to build their own homes. When asked what their secret was, they said, we don't know, we just built a code. <laughs> Wealthy countries can protect dense populations through hardcore, hard shell protection, through building coastal defences like the Thames Barrier uh, and of course, if you're a wealthy country, uh, you can do this across the Thames. You can do this across the mouths of rivers and, and places and so on. That's not really an option that's available for people who live on the Sundarbans in the Ganges Delta. 
it's not available for more diffuse uh, populations, uh, as you can see here. Uh, Bangladesh, by the way, is a country that imports rubble. It imports other people's demolished buildings because of the lack of stone for basic construction purposes. So building hard, um, hard shell kinds of sea defences is really not on the agenda for them. But we can learn from the poor, actually. These uh, pictures here are of a place in Cambodia, the Tonle Sap Lake. Uh, some of you who may have noted recently the passing of former King Sihanouk, one of the roles of the, uh, uh, of the Cambodian king is to preside over a special ceremony which happens when the Tonle Sap River reverses its flow, as it does every year. It's the only river in the world that does this. It's a tributary of the Mekong. And in the monsoon season, the water flows into the Tonle Sap Lake from the Mekong, and in the dry, as it dries out, it flows out of the lake into the Mekong downstream. This means that the, uh, the actual lake edge fluctuates by many kilometres over the course of a year. This presents you with a particular problem if you are deriving your living from the lake, a lot of people deriving their livings from fisheries particularly. If you build your home at the lake's edge in the dry season, you're going to have real problems in the wet season. And if you build it on the edge of the lake in the wet season, you're going to have an awful long walk to work uh, during the dry season. Added to which these people are actually too poor to buy land anyway. So their solution was to build villages actually on the lake. And you can see here there's the floating church. They have floating grocery stores, cinemas, so on and so forth. And this is not just unique to Tonle Sap. Actually, you find these kinds of floating villages also in Vietnam. Uh, there's one in Hong Kong Harbor, uh, actually, in, uh, uh, in the Far East also. Uh, these ideas are now being taken up using modern materials and, uh, uh, and design techniques, uh, in this case by Dutch architects. And we usually think of the Dutch as being the kind of the, the masters of the hard sea defense uh, approach to things with their history of constructing dikes and seawalls. Uh, the top picture is actually a house in a village in the Netherlands, uh, which, actually, which is floating uh, and can move up and down about three meters with fluctuations in, in water level. Uh, the lower picture there is an uh, architect engineer's impression of an apartment building, it could be an office complex, uh, that uh, could be built that was floating on the water. So thinking about perhaps how do we take modern materials, modern design techniques, and take traditional ideas and transpose them into ways of adapting uh, to deal with uh, the challenges of sustainability. Professor Sahail has already spoken at some length about the challenge of the toilet. Um, it's also a, uh, a pet topic of mine. Um, the, nobody in their right minds, as Professor Suhail has already said, would have deliberately designed a system whereby we purify billions of gallons of water to drink in quality to flush toilets with. This is absolutely nuts. And indeed, nobody did design that system. It came about by accident. It came about when various engineers started putting sewers underground because of problems like the great stinks in Paris and London in the 1850s. Uh, problems to do with uh, contaminated drinking supply, uh, such as cholera and the uh, famous, uh, this is the Broad Street Pump. You can go visit it up the road here uh, in London, where Jon Snow famously uh, removed the handle of the pump uh, in order to prevent people from drawing water from it because of cholera contamination. And it was really the combination, simultaneous combination of people putting sewers underground and piping in fresh drinking water into the newly emerging industrial cities of the 19th century uh, that were then linked together, almost incidentally, uh, by Thomas Crapper's um, improvements to the flushing toilet. The flushing toilet had actually been around since the 16th century, but he did the siphon-operated technology here, and linked those two previously separated systems uh, together. Now... Uh, Professor Sahel has already explained part of the motivation for moving away from this technology, which is uh, actually trying to help poor people in developing countries uh, to have adequate access to sanitation without committing themselves to this unsustainable uh, way of linking drinking water supply and human waste management. But the interesting thing, I think, for us at the moment is that this impetus also coincides with two other opportunities. One is the increasing... Uh, amount of construction in semi-arid areas, this is Orange County in the United States, uh, where there actually is a strong incentive uh, for grey water systems and other ways of uh, saving water and perhaps moving away from uh, this piped infrastructure. 
And of course, we also are all familiar with this kind of picture at the top right there, uh, as you look at it, as we find the existing water infrastructures of our cities decaying. So for once, perhaps, the interests of the wealthy and the poor in the world uh, can be brought to coincide in the development of precisely the kinds of technologies Professor Sir Hale was talking about. Interestingly enough, in the same year that Thomas Crapper patented his siphon-operated flushing lavatory improvements, the Reverend Henry Mole came up with the uh, uh, Mole's earth closet. Had that technology taken off, we might today be going for a Mole instead of going for a Crap. Um, uh, but the, the point is that there are now in increasing interest in the kinds of technology that Professor Sohail talked about, but also other kinds of uh, alternative pipeless technologies uh, involving composting and so on and so forth. Another technology I'll just uh, briefly touch on that's done much to shape the city in the last 50 years. This is the lovely Lutyens building, which is the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., where diplomats until 1945 got hardship pay. I lived in Washington, D.C. for 10 years, and I can understand why. It really sucks in the summertime. They stopped getting hardship pay in 1945. You know why? The air conditioner. Uh, and by putting the air conditioner in, uh, basically the need for hardship pay went away. Now, it's very interesting that the early manufacturers of air conditioners um, actually wanted to standardise production. Prior to the air conditioner, it was widely recognised that people, different sorts of people living in different parts of the world had widely different tolerances of heat and humidity. But by standardising and naturalizing our requirements for a particular temperature and humidity. The air conditioning industry was able to uh, streamline mass production uh, for air conditioning, and we saw the transformation of sleepy southern cities like Atlanta into the vast metropolises uh, that they are today. And we also saw at the same time a standardization of building uh, design around the world um, where we no longer had to take account of the natural conditions and adapt to them, which has actually exacerbated the urban heat island effect, uh, which actually then requires more air conditioning, more electricity, more greenhouse gases, so on and so forth. Now, it's interesting that once again, we are beginning to see architects and engineers taking traditional designs and ideas and using modern materials and design techniques uh, to bring them up to date. So this illustration here is the Queenslander house. This was a typical... Uh, Eastern Australian house, um, funnily enough, in Queensland. Uh, and you can see it has many uh, distinctive characteristics, the 360-degree air circulation, uh, the wide uh, eaves over the balconies, uh, and so on, making the most of natural cooling. What happened when air conditioning came along, by the way, was a lot of people filled in the bottoms and made them regular two-storey houses. They were sorry when Queensland flooded uh, later, but and, anyway. Um, we're now beginning to see, though, architects and engineers taking those design principles and you can see this building below which is on the uh, Okanagan campus of the University of British Columbia where the 360 degree air circulation through a, an elevated roof uh, is used to provide similar natural cooling uh, to the building. Another example is this one here. This is the wind tower. You find these all over the Middle East from Morocco uh, to the Yemen. Uh, traditionally the wind blowing across the rooftops was ducted down into the buildings below to provide cooling. And Norman Foster, in his Mazdar project, um, uh, has adapted that. He got aeronautical designers to design this kind of a structure here uh, using the um, most up-to-date computerized uh, technologies for designing aircraft wings and so on to get the most effective conductance of uh, cooler air down into the square below and, indeed, on a massive scale, taking air down into the rocks below uh, to benefit from natural cooling. I couldn't talk about technology shaping the city without briefly at least touching on the motor car. Uh, in uh, 1896, the Red Flag Act was repealed. This was the act that required uh, in England that any motor vehicle, horseless carriage, had to be preceded by a man uh, carrying a red flag. Incidentally, in the same year, 1896, was the first pedestrian traffic fatality in the history of the world. It happened not far from here in Croydon. Uh, a young woman going back from a day's trip out to the Crystal Palace was run over by a French demonstrator model. Uh, the Croydon coroner said, and I quote, this must never be allowed to happen again. Um, go figure. Steve, are you able to conclude in a minute or Just so? a minute, literally, literally, have literally a minute. Be lovely. In less than 60 years, in, in less than 100 years, certainly in the US in less than 60 years, we went from the Red Flag Act uh, 
uh, to this kind of uh, configuration. Now, in some ways, that's frightening, but in other ways, it might be um, a, uh, uh, an opportunity for a little bit of optimism as well, because it shows that when things are aligned in, in particular ways, you can actually have very rapid technological change and very rapid infrastructure change. Um, traffic in London in 1900 went at about 11 miles an hour. Uh, traffic in London in 2000 went at about 11 miles an hour. Um, and another possibility here, as we've all heard of the Boris bike, um, is the equivalent might be the sort of Boris car or whoever it is uh, that comes up, not the Boris car off. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the idea here is basically you've got driverless vehicles that are moving around the city uh, with computer-controlled um, routes. Um, they, uh, you would then get out your, uh, your mobile device and simply say, I want, you know, three people going to such and such at such a time. The computer would then calculate the deviation from the existing route for one of these things to come and pick you up and take you in relative comfort to where you're going. You don't have to park your car. You can have a few glasses of wine and not worry about getting breathalyzed on the way home. Isn't that a marvelous idea? Um, so there's ways in which here we can uh, see, in a sense, a return almost to the Victorian notion of the cab and the hackney carriage, um, uh, traditional ideas. I don't have time to talk about the light bulb uh, or about the elevator. Um, but certainly without those innovations which happened in the uh, 1880s and the 1850s respectively, uh, we would never have seen that. And I say without the flush toilet as well, actually, and the light bulb and the elevator, we would never have seen that. After today, we may not see that again, but um, uh, <laughs> I sincerely hope that won't turn out to be the case. Um, just to briefly mention transitional technologies, it's important that we understand technologies that take us from where we are to where we could be. This one's very important, the oil lamp. Humanity has only ever given up one energy source in its history. Anybody know what it was? Whale oil. Whale oil, exactly. And why? Because you could burn kerosene in the same lamp. So it took you, uh, it was a technology that could take you from one technological configuration to another. Same thing with uh, hybrid cars. I will predict they won't be around in 15 years' time. We only really have uh, the gasoline engine in there because of people's range anxiety. I could tell a similar story with respect to air conditioning and so forth. Finally, greening of buildings. Uh, actually growing ivy up the walls of buildings to provide uh, cooling and insulation is a very old uh, practice. Uh, we do it a lot in Oxford. Uh, this is actually a building in Singapore. And there are people who are now thinking about the possibility of pushing that idea even further into vertical horticulture, vertical agriculture. I don't think we'll ever feed the world this way, but it certainly could change the way that we're living in cities. So I'll just finally leave you with this image. Uh, this is by the Argentinian artist who works in uh, Frankfurt, Germany, Thomas Saracino. This is an installation that he did in Hong Kong, uh, Cities in the Sky. Not again because I'm suggesting that we'll be going there anywhere soon, but it does, I think, bring home that thinking about the challenge of sustainability in urban environments isn't just a design problem or a manufacturing problem. It really is a challenge to the human imagination. Thank you very much. What an amazing world tour you took us on in your, in your allotted time. Thank you so much. I, I should also point out one of the few things not in your slides there is that Deutsche Bank has created one of the most eco-friendly high-rise buildings in the world when it refurbished its Frankfurt headquarters not so long ago. Uh, so 98% of its pre-existing space was recycled, and the result is an 89% reduction in CO2 emissions. I knew all this before I came. And a 74% reduction in water use per year. So beat that or go and have a look at it. Um, running out of time, but I wonder if we could just... If any questions that arise from that fantastic panoply of uh, things that Steve brought up, perhaps we could take a couple together. You cannot have lost the will to live after that. It was no, so but stimulating. The, 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 the will to drink is stronger. I think the will to drink may be stronger. And you were the one who brought up the wine. Now, look, now, but someone has resisted. Yes, sir. I'd be interested in knowing why you think the hybrid car concept or product, um, production of hybrid cars won't be around in 15 years' time. Yes. Well, because Turn largely the, the, the hybrid car is a transitional technology. It's, it's, it's the one that enables us to still go have mobility and to be able to rely on gas stations or petrol stations in order to fill the cars up to ensure that we have an adequate long distance range. Uh, on the other hand, we want to have the benefits of an electric car. As plug-in electric vehicles uh, improve and people have more confidence in their range, 
and also realize that actually most of the time they don't drive that far that they're going to run out of battery juice. And as batteries improve, mm. as all those things happen, the need for keeping that vestigial gasoline-powered engine in the vehicle will go away for um, most uh, car uses. Certainly those that are uses within the city or within the urban environment. For other uses going between cities, that's a different, maybe, maybe a different situation. And it may well be that we will rely on things like hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, for those longer distance transportation. Certainly, we may well be looking at hydrogen fuel cell trucks and buses uh, uh, in the future. Uh, but again, I think we will be moving away from the gasoline engine. Yes, Tony. You can come and find me in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, and tell me <laughs> exactly. if I'm wrong. So you come in you, a hybrid car. You, you, you were, you, so Tony Curzon Price from Intelligence Squared and Open Democracy. Um, you, you, you put a lot of emphasis on lock in, but I wonder about emphasis on the opposite thing, which is surely at a suitable historical scale, every technology is transitional. And doesn't that apply to the city as well? And what are the developments which would actually make the city obsolete and aren't we seeing one of them which is very good non-atom based uh, uh, transport and communication through um, transport of information just to the contrary i would argue in fact that far from the city becoming uh, redundant uh, or uh, outliving its usefulness we have we are living in the middle of the biggest migration in human history the biggest migration in human history over half the world now lives in cities. It's the migration from the countryside to the city. Uh, within 20 years, it'll be 70% of the world's population living in cities. And I think that's terribly exciting because there's all sorts of things you can do when you've got a concentrated population. You have much more creativity, um, which you don't actually get with the extended um, uh, networks where you don't have face-to-face -face interaction uh, that you get with the web. That serves a different purpose, and it can reinforce that face-to-face uh, interaction, but it's terribly important. If you look at uh, any of the works of people like Richard Florida um, and uh, uh, other authors who've been looking at the, uh, the way in which cities are centres of creativity, they will all emphasise that it's the density of population, the serendipitous interchanges that people have, meeting with each other, bringing ideas together and so on, that seems to m make a city flexible and dynamic. If you compare, for example, uh, and also the presence of higher education institutions seems to be uh, a key factor. And so indeed events like this. Any last question just before we, we head off? Uh, yes, sir, the red tie. Yeah, George Latham from Web Asset Management. Um, I was interested in your thoughts about um, one of the other potential bit large changes, which is about how we receive our energy supply um, in, in the... the the, the, the institutional lock-in, I suppose, is to have large centralised energy supply, and we've heard from Desert Tech earlier on this evening, but it felt, it's felt over the last 10 years or so as if there's a move towards more decentralised energy supply. Is that another change that you see? I think that's a bit of a pastoral fantasy, personally. Um, certainly if you take into account the, uh, the, the great migration that I just mentioned uh, into the city, the notion that we will have rooftop PV and rooftop windmills that will provide our energy in a decentralized way. That's fine if you're living out in the country in Colorado or even in uh, uh, Somerset or something like that, but it's not going to really work for, uh, for the city. So I think we are still committed uh, to large uh, central station forms of generation, in fact, of the sort that uh, uh, we heard in respect to the Desert Tech uh, uh, Foundation. Uh, and those kinds of smart, the, the smart grids that will be necessary uh, to integrate different forms of generation uh, and uh, to be able to ensure that you're storing inter intermittent sources in the grid and so on uh, are all key factors in that. But I don't see, uh, frankly, a move towards a highly decentralized uh, system in which we could dispense with uh, either large scale generating projects or uh, uh, or, or the, the grids that uh, are necessary to distribute their products. Thank you very much. Thank Steve. you.